Medierne fortæller ofte om et klima, som er i krise på grund af den menneskelige udlænding af CO2. Men er klimaet i krise, og ved vi nok om klimaets komplekse systemer til at konkludere, at CO2 er årsagen til, at klimaet ændrer sig? Det snakker jeg med Dr. Judy Curry om i dag. Velkommen indenfor. Dr. Judy Curry, thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, my pleasure. Mm-hmm. Um, for those who don't know you, can you please give a short introduction who you are? Okay. Um, my current position is I'm president of Climate Forecast Applications Network, which is a um, company that helps people interpret weather and climate information, but Um, I've spent most of my career in university, um, and I recently retired from Georgia Institute of Technology in the U.S., where I was chairman of the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences for 13 years. And I've, you know, published, you know, researched a wide variety of topics related to climate change. Mm. So you've been teaching or researching or, or both? Um, mostly researching and administration at the university. Mm-hmm. So uh, field research and... Uh, no, not so field, a little bit of field research, but mostly um, theoretical <laughs> thinking, mm. data analysis, that kind of thing. Oh, yes. okay. See. So the media often tell us about that the climate is uh, about to go crazy that we are on the edge of a climate catastrophe. How is your point of this, that uh, view, how how you see the status of the climate at, at this point? Well, I think the climate is fine <laughs> right now. Mm. Um, it's much better than a um, hundred years ago when it was actually colder. I mean, in the late 1900s people referenced the pre-industrial period but that was we were coming out of the little ice age it was really very cold that was nobody's idea of a very nice climate um, i think our climate is currently fine in terms of extreme weather events hurricanes floods droughts they were really worse in the 1930s and the 1950s so there's nothing particularly wrong with our climate right now Uh, the concern is about what's coming next later in the 21st century from man-made global warming. But I would say right now our climate is just fine. So do, do you see any uh, climate catastrophe in the in the future? Even uh, if the, the climate being like a little warmer? Um, the only thing to worry about is the potential collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet. Um, again, this is a fairly unstable ice sheet, um, and if it did collapse, it's more likely to be due from geologic processes than from global warming, but that's, I think, the main concern in my mind, but that's not going to happen on the, well, it's very unlikely to happen on the time scale of the 21st century, um, you know, maybe 22nd century, something like that. But to me, that's what I see as the main bad thing that could happen. I mean, you know, the issue is humans are the most adaptable species on the planet. We put people on the moon, and now people are worried about one degree of warming. I mean, you know, and people generally, um, at least in the U.S., People are still moving south. The population of California, Arizona, Texas, and Florida is exploding. <laughs> people are moving from the from the north to the south. I mean, so hmm. um, people generally seem to like the warmer weather. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So if seeing in the in the prehistoric climate records, the climate has been much warmer and colder than today. So and 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 Antarctica clearly survived this kind of period like uh, much warmer than, uh, than the current climate yeah th- this isn't a particularly you know exceptional climate um mm. it's warmer than we've seen you know in 
apparently in, in, in a number of hundreds of years. Um, there's still debate about whether we're warmer than you know, 2,000 years ago or whatever. Uh, I think the mid-Holocene period, about 5,000 to 8,000 years ago, was probably warmer than what we are now. So, you know, it's not, are we influencing the climate? Yes, we don't really understand how much we're in influencing it relative to natural climate variability. Is, is warm or worse than colder? Well, no. not so far. <laughs> so, I mean, that's mm. the way I see it. Uh, many of your views about this climate go against the so-called consensus. Uh, what have the reaction been on, on the science, from the science community and the political uh, environment thoughts? Well, well, a lot of climate scientists have become political mm. activists. Okay, and they're, you know, 200,000 followers on Twitter and really have publicity agents and the whole works. I mean, and, and this is like big business for them. Um, you know, writing books that sell a lot of copies, going on the lecture cir circuit and charging a lot of money for their lectures. Okay, so are, are, are those scientists anymore even? No, they're you know, they're behaving like politicians um, and they're more interested in the publicity and influencing politics. So there's a whole branch of climate science that has gone in that direction. Um, the people, what I would call the rank and files, sitting at their desks or going out in the field and making measurements and, and evaluating theories and stuff like that, um, I'm, I'm not an outsider at all in that community. Um, I'm, the people who are political activists don't like me because I raise uncomfortable mm. questions. Did, did that have any consequences for you, like uh, privately or career? Oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, oh, okay. I, I left my, I retired prematurely from my university position. Um, people in the administration didn't like what I was doing. I became marginalized. And I could see the writing on the wall, and I said, you know, no, I would much rather uh, be in the private sector and work for myself rather than having to play these kind of games. So I retired prematurely from the university. Mm. Is that something you, you see uh, from other uh, scientists who, who share your opinion, that, uh, that, that it has some kind of consequences for their private and career? Um, sure, they're very quiet. A, a lot of people, especially those who work for government labs, are very quiet about what their opinion is about all this because they don't want to get in trouble. They, they, you know, people are, and it shouldn't, okay, I can understand that being a problem in a government lab, but in a university, no, you should really be able to uh, challenge the orthodoxy. And I mean, that, that's what research and science is all about. I mean, that's our job to challenge the conclusions and continue to reevaluate the evidence. That's what we're supposed to do as scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, you have been in the, in the science community for a long time, I, I believe. Uh, when did you see this kind of shift to, into like uh, scientists who behave like uh, politicians? Um, you know, it started in the late 1980s, but it was really just a few people, you know, they they were attracted by seats at the big policy tables and, you know, it was just a few elite kind of scientists. Um, after Climate Gate in, two, in 2009, 2010, it, uh, I saw a big uptick in activism and it became more um, more appealing, apparently, to a wide number of scientists to become activists. And especially after, I would say, the fifth assessment report from the IPCC in 2013, there was another uptick. And, and now it's become so bad, say, in the last five years, that it's very difficult for somebody who isn't an activist, <laughs> you know, to, you know, it, it's sort of the default expectation. You know, it, it, 
you're you're an inactivist. Everybody, you know, you're you're if you're not for them, if you're just trying to be neutral and do your science, I mean, the activists regard you as being against them. Um, you know, it's just become it's not science anymore. This is politics. It's mm. a very sad situation. Yeah, and, and and I do understand uh, as a young scientist, if you're not uh, governmentally uh, employed, then you have to go out and do some research, and you need funding for doing research, and, and mostly this kind of funding come from government, and and they decide which is going to get that or not. So if your project or your interest is not in climate, then you will probably not get funding for your research. Yeah. Um, that's true, and and they, they mm. even like. In the U.S., they they have announcements of opportunity. They give you topics that they're accepting proposals on, so they've already sort of pre-accepted, you know, a certain line of research, and dismissing other lines. So it's it, it's very difficult. Mm. Um, like I said, and that that's why I'm in the private sector now, where it's um, makes much more sense to me. Yeah. Mm. It seems like a. Organizations like uh, NASA, like have, that has been a, a proud organization, putting pu- people on the moon and developing uh, advanced technology. Now they, they become more and more like a climate research organization more than anything else. Uh, oh, yeah. are, are, the, are the governments using this kind of, kind of image, in your opinion, to, to make their policy, policy come out? like like? Uh, organizations like uh, NASA or NOAA, uh, they have a good, pretty good brand, and people generally trust what come out of the of the, the, the those organizations. Well, in mm. in the U.S., not so much. There have been some. They, mm. they have like a like a press organization, mm. people who run the websites and the press, and that that seems oh. to be fairly disconnected. <laughs> <laughs> from what oh. actually goes on in the agencies, so you know, oh, I don't I know. There, it just seemed like uh, the, their credibility have yeah, have maybe so. gone down a little bit since they've been so so focused on climate rather than anything else. Yeah, um, in certain circles, the credibility has gone down. Yes. Talking about the climate, uh, it has been said that the, the CO two level, the concentration of CO two in the atmosphere has been almost close to saturated. That means that, that if we if we put more CO2 in the atmosphere, it doesn't really do much more warming, or if any. Uh, do you agree with that? Well, okay, the, the, the warming, you know, the, the response, it, it's logarithmic. So as, as the concentration gets higher, it has less of an impact, but the more warming it then, then water vapor starts to take over and there's other gases and once it really gets, starts to get a lot of co2 then certain addi- additional absorption bands open up so i mean we're we're not close to <laughs> being you know completely saturated out so i mean it it there there's a logarithmic dependence but i don't regard that as a big issue like for the kind of concentrations we're talking about in the 21st no. century. So even like uh, the level would rise to like, let's say 800 parts per million, you don't see any like kind of big rise in temperature. It, oh yeah, that if, if it rises to 800, there would be some rise in temperature. Um, how much? There, There's a great deal of uncertainty about the sensitivity of how much warming, even the IPCC in their likely range has a factor of three uncertainty <laughs> in terms of the climate sensitivity. And then if you take it to the very likely range, a factor of six. So that's a level of uncertainty mm. we're talking about. Um, so. And I guess that's that's the problem with this climate policy that we, that they, they really want to stigmatize CO2 for being uh, the bad boy who controlled the climate, but in reality, we don't really know how much or how less it, it, it impacts the climate. Is well, we know that it's acting in a warming direction. All other things mm-hmm. being equal, it's warming, but whether it's dominating over natural variability, nobody has ever demonstrated that to my satisfaction. Um, 
Mm. So, uh, <clears throat> we, you know, we just don't know how much warming we'll see, you know, for the remainder of the 21st century. Um, another degree, maybe, it wouldn't surprise me, is that a really terrible thing? Probably not. <laughs> um, the, the issue is more mm. about is, is warming dangerous. That's, to me, mm. what they've never really demonstrated. Uh, I mean, most people tend to like a slightly warmer climate. Mm. You know, the main <laughs> thing to worry about is sea level rise. The, coming out of the little ice age, the sea level started rising about 1860. Mm. And that wasn't driven by CO2. Uh, that was just driven by <clears throat> various natural climate processes. Mm. You know, since then we've seen a little bubble of acceleration in the last 20 years, which is mostly due to Greenland melting. But some people argue mm. that that's caused by the Atlantic circulations, not so much by global warming. Mm. So, yeah, the reason I, I read that they, they might have, might be some volcanic activity on the, the Greenland ice sheet. Um, <clears throat> there is a little bit. Um, I think it's a bigger issue mm. for the West Antarctic ice sheet. There's a lot of mm. geologic activity down there. So that contributes mm. to it also, as well as Atlantic circulations. So there's, you know, mm. nature is complicated. Trying to blame everything on increasing carbon dioxide, I think, is, is very naive. Politically convenient mm. for some, but very naive in terms of the science. Mm. Indeed. Um, the global temperature from for the last 200 years or so, they, it's been rising about one degree Celsius. Uh, there's been some debate about how much how much this this CO2 uh, rise in CO2 has has uh, done to the to the warming in the last century, or is it like a one and a half degree, or, or is it is it nothing on all, or is it even smaller than that? Uh, what is, what is your opinion on this? How, how much of, of a warming has the CO2 rising? Well, we don't really to? quite know, but I would say it's about half. Half of the mm. warming we've seen could be from CO2. But we saw mm. a big, a grand solar maximum in the late mm. 20th century. And mm -hmm. following 1976 we saw a big shift in the pacific circulation patterns and then another big one in 1995 in the atlantic circulation patterns both of which were acting in the warming direction so you know we've had a boost from natural climate variability over the uh, second half of the 20th century so in the 20th in the 21st century you know looking towards mid 21st century we expect to see a solar minimum, and we, we could s expecting to see a shift to the cold phase of the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. So those two things would slow things down, I would guess, sometime in mid-21st century. But um, I'm sure we'll be surprised by how the climate of mm. the 21st century plays out, because it's you know, the whole climate system is chaotic and our yeah. understanding is inadequate. So, you know, I'm sure yeah. we'll be, there will be some Many see a, a, a new kind of small little ice age coming due to the grand solar minimum approaching. Um, um, I, I don't think it would kick in mm. a little ice age like what we saw in the 1700s because mm. we're overall, you know, just warmer than that. Yeah. But we could definitely see a slowdown. Mm. We could definitely see a slowdown in the warming. As I understand it, uh, when the climate shifts towards warmer climate, the, the, the tropics, the, the area around the tropics, more or less stay as it is, while the, the higher latitude get warmer as the as the climate get warmer, and and of an opposite, when they get colder, the, the tropic get stays more or less the same, but the higher latitude kind of the, the weather shift downwards towards the south. Uh, is that correctly understood? Well, yeah, the, the mid latitudes and high latitudes have much show much more mm. climate variability than the tropics sure. do. Yeah. Um, and as I understand the greenhouse effect, it, it takes place at the top of, of the atmosphere around the, near the troposphere. Uh, what, what I see 
when I said, look at the data uh, as a layman, it seems like it kind of did, didn't have any warming at all. Uh, that the layer of the uh, that layer of the atmosphere, uh, since like uh, actually seems like it, it been slightly cooling since the 1980s. Uh, Okay, well, well, stratospheric, upper stratospheric cooling is expected from global warming. So um, the debate about the tropical upper tropospheric temperature, um, the satellite observations disagree with the models and different satellite groups disagree with each other. And so there's just not a lot of good understanding of what, what's going on up there but oh. um so it com yeah. comes down to like uh, just like co2 we don't not really we're not really sure what happens well we don't have you know the observations aren't really good enough to um to really measure the radiation budget at the top of the atmosphere to the degree of accuracy that we need and like i said there's still debate about trying to interpret what's going on in the upper atmosphere in the tropics which should be a fingerprint for global warming there's still debate about that so it's just like, like the signals are fuzzy because our observing systems are inadequate we're looking at small sig we're looking for small signals mm. up there it could with all the advanced technology we have available now it could seem a little odd to be not able to measure uh, accurate enough uh, is it due to lack of uh, technology or funding or uh, Oh, it's funding priorities. Mm. Um, people have floated proposals to measure detailed spectral mm. radiation at the top of the atmosphere. And, you know, it just wasn't competitive with whatever mm. else NASA was funding. Um, is it because the satellite is not accurate enough or do, do you need more satellites? Uh, oh. No, it's just priorities. You know, it's just pr th th there's a whole sure. process for funding, you know. This group wants to measure the salinity of the ocean surface. That group wants to measure the biomass, mm. you know, over mm. land. You know, that there's a lot of and people want to measure clouds. Mm. And so there's a lot of competing proposals. Oh. You know, not everything gets mm. funded. Um, okay. Yeah, I would like to see <laughs> more, you know, more satellite, higher quality satellite observations. I think that would mm. be a good thing. But like you know, there's priorities. Yeah. I guess it's, there's only a, a certain number of satellites and, and everyone have to use them for, for whatever they want. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, so it's just competitive, oh. you know, so in terms of getting these and, things And it seems like they're not really launched that many satellites, like new satellites anymore. Like it's kind of slowed down. Um, yeah, not so much, you know. But maybe it's just a feeling. It, it's been tough getting... Um, yeah, it's it's been tough. There's been debates. Do we need you know big, huge satellites with lots mm. of instruments, or small satellites, or uh, mini satellites? Mm. And you know, I, I agree. There hasn't been as much new satellite observing systems. As and I and talking about NASA, like we talked before, that uh, before the the climate uh, department of NASA was a small unit as I as I understand it like in the 80s like the uh, climate didn't didn't take up mu take up much research in NASA they they, they were more like uh, uh, sending stuff to space and developing new technologies yeah the air well there's a, always competition between the planetary and the solar and the earth mm. divisions and and also technology and, and aircraft so, so there's a lot of different divisions in mm. NASA um, the Earth, depending on the administration, you know, whether they emphasize Earth versus mm. space. And that, that has varied. I've seen that varied. I used to sit on NASA advisory mm. panels, so I was more up to date oh. earlier. I mean, I, I no longer mm. do that kind of thing. Um, I'm no longer invited to do that <laughs> kind of thing. Um, so I don't have any particular inside information no. at this point about what's going on at NASA. But it seems like climate, the, cl the, the, the focus on CO2 and cl human caused global warming has taken over from all the other topics, uh, funding-wise. Not this, to some mm. extent, yeah. Okay.
uh, I have some friend in uh, in in US and uh, Australia. I, I talk to once in a while. Um, for, they seem to notice that it, it getting colder, in the, especially the summer hot days. Uh, getting like number of hot days has gone down in the last like couple of maybe five years. Uh, is this something that uh, is just coincidence or, or is this kind of a trend in the observation? Do you know? There's a lot of spatial variability in terms of what's going on with the climate. Um, mm. Like in the southeast U.S., we have overall been not warming. <laughs> you know, there's like a little warming hole. Um, there's also like land use and urban heat island effects that affects things at different kinds of the seasons, daytime versus nighttime. Um, in the U.S., we've had a very, very cold winter, again, and that's largely from La Nina, the natural uh, circulation pattern. So people's, per, you know, so there's a lot of space and time variability um, in the, in local, you know, in the climate and your local climate. If you, even if you look at the U.S. as a whole, there's been very little warming over the last hundred years. If you look at other regions, there's been a lot of warming. So there's a lot of space and time variability in terms of what's going on with the climate. I wouldn't read too much into anyone's perception no. of their mm. local climate. And, yeah. and I guess you can see the, the climate as small a local or regional climate that shift in some kind of pattern. Right. Yeah, but but the point is, is people don't really notice a one a one degree change, you know, in average climate. I mean, because the day to day variation and the seasonal variation is so much larger. So what we're seeing is this trend is really pretty small. People don't really perceive it. And like I said, in the U.S., people are still overall moving to the south, not to the north. They'd rather have the warmer temperatures. Yeah, people don't. Yeah. Um, um, I um, as I see you've done some research in in uh, extreme weather like hurricanes. Um, mm -hmm. Did have we seen an increase in these events, extreme uh, weather events? Um, no, even the IPCC doesn't really. See see much in the way of, you know, an increase in extreme weather events. Um, mm. Globally, you know, the number of hurricanes has been, you know, fairly constant for a very long time. Um, mm. There's some hint of an increase in the number of major hurricanes. There's some increase in intensity, um, mm. whether that's natural variability or global warming, it's hard to sort out. But that there's not much of a discernible change. Um, mm. You know, every event, you know, that strikes land is horrible, but mm. still the, the, the record breaking horrible hurricanes, a lot of them were in the 1920s, the 1930s and the, you know, mm. the 1950s. Um, there were a lot of really bad ones. And even in the uh, 19th century, there were a lot of really bad hurricanes, even when mm. temperatures were much colder. So there's no simple relationship mm. between hurricanes and And I guess it's, it's much uh, easier for us to predict them now and, and make a forecast so we can get people people out of the way. Oh yeah, so so there's, sure, so, so mm. there's much less loss of life. And, and people can prepare. Um, the electric, you know, electric utilities are better at Mm. you know, figuring out how to prevent damage and to bring electricity back up quickly and stuff like that. How about, so we're figuring out, yeah. How about an extreme cold weather like blizzards and some, it seems like the last four or five winters, the U.S. has, has had a kind of tough winters, uh, especially in the north, uh, north U.S. and mid, mid U.S. Uh, well, th this year it was the south U.S. that really oh. got clobbered. Uh, yeah, Texas and, and the southern states just had that horrible cold wave, record-breaking cold wave in um, in February. Um, overall, as the temperatures warm, you get fewer of these cold outbreaks, but that doesn't mean you don't get any of them. And, and, and this particular one was a record breaker. It broke a number of temperature records that have stood for 100 years. Mm. So... 
Um, I guess they're not used to that. Um, <clears throat> well, they they mm. get one like that about once a decade. Um, so, mm. but this was a particularly bad one. Uh, we we did talk about it a little bit, but do do we know what caused this extreme weather to increase or decrease, or is it very like regional, like uh, it might dec- increase in the Atlantic Ocean, but not in the Pacific Ocean, or vice versa? Well, it, well, it, it's the ocean circulation patterns. Um, you know, the El Nino, La Nina, the Atlantic, multi-decadal oscillation, Pacific decadal oscillation. But the El Nino, okay, when you see high hurricane activity in the in the Atlantic, then there's low activity in the Pacific, and that's related to El Nino and La Nina because they have opposite effects in the Atlantic versus Pacific. Um, for example, so um, yeah, Pacific was mm-hmm. very quiet last year. <laughs> we had a uh, we had a big year in the Atlantic. Mm-hmm. How about tornadoes in yeah. the U.S. Tornadoes. Um, again, tornadoes is really it's it's a bad year for the U.S. because when we have mm. a La Nina winter, um, that's always oh. bad for the tornadoes. So I mean, it's but there have been. There were years, say in the last decade, where we had oh. hardly any tornadoes. Um, but it's really, it, it's really more tied mm. to the La Nina okay. situation this year. Why um, we're seeing a lot of tornadoes. There's still a lot of, you know, knowledge about uh, our, you know, understanding about this climate system. There's still a lot of gaps uh, in in it. Uh, what would you say would, would is the biggest mysteries that we we still need to understand? Oh, there's a huge yeah. list. The biggest is really these modes of natural variability, circulations in the oceans. Um, we don't really understand how all this relates to um, local weather, how it interacts with global warming. Um, we don't really understand a lot about how the ocean transports heat vertically, how it stores carbon. There's a great deal of uncertainty about clouds and um, how clouds will change in a warmer climate and how cloud patterns vary with all these natural circulation patterns. There's a whole lot that we don't understand. And thinking that carbon dioxide is this simple control knob mm. on the climate is very naive. Um, so, so, so there's still a lot of like uh, basic research to be, to be done before we understand a lot of big oh and the other thing that we really don't understand is how the sun mm. interacts with the climate there's a lot of indirect mm. effects from the sun that really mm. aren't accounted in climate models that mm. in, in my opinion could mm-hmm. have a pretty significant effect so that's another big uncertainty is how the sun interacts so it's, with the uh, climate. it's still kind of uh, everything is still kind of like uh, debatable uh, in, for the climate system Oh, there, there's mm. lots of room for disagreements. There's lots of things we just mm. flat out don't understand. Okay, if I give you the power tomorrow to to be the like to change the world policies about the climate and environment, what would you change? What what would, would be your priorities uh, if not for carbon dioxide? Well, first off, is I would get rid of like all these UN organizations. Mm. <laughs> or making these proclamations and all mm. these deadlines and targets. I mm. mean, nobody's meeting them, and it's it's um, they spend so much time on all these targets and deadlines, but nobody's accomplishing anything. Okay, so what do we need to accomplish? Well, we need to slow down the real pollution, you know, air and water and soil pollution. Okay, that's bad. We, we need to clean that up. Okay, that's important. Improve the air quality, especially. Um, the other thing is we need to think about the 21st century infrastructure. I mean, what do we want the transportation and the electricity infrastructure to look like for the 21st century? And what, what should our buildings look like? And we should have a forward looking, you know, trying to quickly 
patch in wind and solar power is, is to me doing more harm than good in the long run because these are not <laughs> really good power sources um, and, and we're wasting a lot of resources right now by implementing them. We're locking in fossil fuels for sure because that's the only way you can ramp up and ramp down to account for the variability of wind and solar. So, you know, in the long run, the emphasis on wind and solar is probably slowing us down. Um, what we need is In the natural course of things, we would probably be phasing out fossil fuels by the end of the 21st century anyways. I mean, they're a finite resource and there's always a drive to cleaner sources of electricity. Um, but trying to push that up so quickly, I think is doing more harm than good is preventing, you know, developing countries, especially in Africa from developing I mean, they need grid electricity. There's a lot of energy poverty in the world that we should be looking to, to address rather than make the situation worse. So I think the current drive to rapidly implement wind and solar has been counterproductive to actually reducing emissions in the long term because it's really not going to work. And it's also slowing down human development um, and economic development, you know, in South Asia and, and Africa in particular. And so that's not a good thing. So, you know, figure out how to end energy poverty. <laughs> and a lot of research and development into better electricity transmission technologies, uh, generation four nuclear, um, geothermal, and some of these things that I think have more promise than than wind and solar. I mean, just the land use alone for wind and solar makes it sort of not feasible, certainly for most European countries. You just, you know, you're, the population density is too high. Um, in the U.S., we have vast expanses of land where there's nothing. So we've, we have more space here in the U.S., but you definitely don't have it in Europe. Um, but, um, yeah, so... so Yeah, Ger Germany in particular, that, that's really a messy situation. I'm less familiar with what's going on in Denmark, but I know Germany is really quite a mess in terms of their whole energy situation. In, Den in Denmark, we, have, uh, we are dependent on, on energy from outside because our wind farm. Oh, right, right, okay. Yeah. So if, if the wind doesn't blow, then uh, we need the uh, energy from yeah, uh, coal fire power plants in uh, Germany or, or harder power electricity from uh, Norway or a nuclear power from uh, France. Um, but, uh, but as uh, German, Germany uh, closed down all their coal fire power plants, it, it's, it, they, they're going to get worse and worse. I mean, the, the simple truth is we need another generation of fossil fuel power. Um, mm. we, and, and we need to buy mm. time until, um, you know, the uh, adding new nuclear power mm. takes time. <laughs> we need, you know, more research and development. We need more advanced transmission mm. uh, system. Um, you know, we're just not there yet. And, and and today, and today we are able to burn uh, coal much cleaner than we did, like let's say in the 80s. We, the technology has come into right. play, so we can remove most of yeah. the pollution. And, and talking about pollution, uh, uh, many see CO2 as pollution. It's not pollution, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and all of this is moot since mm. the, the China has just come out with a new five-year plan and they're building new coal-powered plants like crazy. So. I mean, all of what Europe and the U.S. is trying to do is moot in the face of 
all of this stuff coming from China. So in, until the technologies are there, there's not much we can do. Um, yeah. No. Uh, what is the future for you? Do you have any, like you retired, but you still uh, engaged in the... Oh no, oh. I have a company. My company is Climate mm -hmm. Forecast Applications Network. I'm president mm -hmm. of the company. Uh, we provide weather forecasts, um, mostly for the energy and the insurance sectors, and also do a lot of climate scenarios. Um, like right now, I'm working on a big project for wind farm investors. They want to know, um, you know, how much wind we're going to have over the next 30 years in their wind farm locations, things like that. So um, doing a lot of basic research. I mean, a lot of these practical problems that people have, you know, need research being done. So I'm doing research, but it's all targeted at these, you know, very applied needs that people have, you know, for better understanding about hurricanes, climate over the next decade, longer range predictions oh. of heat waves. You know, these are some of the uh, cold waves. These are some of the kinds of problems mm. I'm working on. One of the projects that we have going on right now is better mm. prediction of rapid intensification of hurricanes. Um, you know, like last year, we saw a number of instances where the hurricanes rapidly intensified mm. right before landfall. <laughs> that was surprising. We need to predict that better. So these are some of the kinds of things that I'm working on. Mm. And this is funded for by clients, by people mm. in industry who have a problem and need oh. it to be addressed. Um, rather than, other, mm. you know, occasionally I get a government grant to do some mm -hmm. research, but most of this is funded through clients and through industry. Like certain tasks, they ask for certain tasks for you to do. Yeah, mm. exactly. They're, they're okay. looking. So it's not, they're not funding me to do whatever I feel like doing. They have a mm. specific problem mm -hmm. that needs to be addressed. And then I figure out how to, how to address it. Thank you very much, Judy Curry, okay. for talking to me. I appreciate it. Okay. Well, thank you.